Yeah, well, thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you, Reverend Tyler, very, very much. Um, when Reverend Tyler on Sunday, Easter Sunday, announced this event uh, before the congregation, he asked me to stand up. And he said, even though I'm not a member of Mother Bethel, I'm like a member. And I, I think that's true. And he said uh, also, uh, this evening, we were just talking, uh, and he says that, uh, that I, um, I attend church sometimes more often than his members. Uh, so I'm a member in spirit, uh, and I, I really do uh, respect and honor the African Methodist Episcopal tradition as part of the history of the black radical tradition, but of the black church and theological tradition. Uh, you know, we can never say enough about the majesty and significance of the black church in the struggle for freedom in this country and around the world. And um, our topic this evening is Martin Luther King and Mahatma Gandhi, our single garment of destiny in the struggle for peace and freedom. Uh, first of all, uh, why a single garment of destiny? Why not just a garment of destiny that is black, a garment of destiny that is white, and one that is Asian? Why a single garment of destiny? <clears throat> well, a single garment of destiny because humanity is more united. I can talk into this. Okay. Yes, I'll get closer. A single garment of destiny because humanity is more united than ever before in the history of the human race. Uh, whether we like it or not, we are bound in a single garment of destiny. And Martin Luther King was fond of quoting the English poet John Donne, who wrote the poem, and I'd like to just quote a part of it to you, who wrote the poem called No Man is an Island. And John Donne said, no man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. Any man's death diminishes me because I am involved in mankind. And therefore never, never send to know for whom the bells toll. It, to, it tolls for thee. Because we are all a part of humanity, an injury to one is an injury to all. And we must, as human beings, take responsibility for the entirety of the human race. Having said that, uh, King in 1967, at the last convention of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, an organization that he helped to found in the late 1950s and which spearheaded the Southern Civil Rights Movement, at the last convention that he spoke at in August 1967, Martin Luther King asked the question, where do we go from here? chaos, or community. And it seems that the answer 
at least as far as the United States is concerned, that we chose not what King called the beloved community, but we chose chaos. And that is what we are experiencing today. King reminded his audience at that convention that the United States suffered from three evils, evils of war, racism, and economic exploitation. And that unless the nation came to grips with these three evils, it would descend into chaos. And so that is where we are today. But this is also the 150th anniversary of Mahatma Gandhi. Last year was the 150th anniversary of W.E.B. Du Bois, and we in Philadelphia celebrated that year. And the celebration of the year of Du Bois, it seems, would not be complete without celebrating the year of Mahatma Gandhi. But to celebrate Mahatma Gandhi in 2019 is also to celebrate Martin Luther King, Jr., who was perhaps Gandhi's greatest disciple. In fact, it is fair to say that King himself was a Mahatma. The term Mahatma is an honorific term, which means a great soul. A great soul who by linking knowledge and love comes closer to God. King was a great soul. So, Tonight we are celebrating two Mahatmas. So before I go any further, I really want to thank Chad Lasseter and the Pennsylvania Commission on Human Rights, Civil Rights, I'm sorry. Human Relations. Human Relations, forgive me. Because he has the vision of extending the work of that commission beyond legalisms and technicalities and to attempt to infuse a vision into the struggle, the continuing struggle for civil and human rights in the state of Pennsylvania. And I'm very happy to announce that the commission has agreed to be a partner with us in the year of Gandhi. So I want to say thank you to Chad and to his colleagues and to the commission. <clears throat> now, as I've said, this is Gandhi's 150th birthday. Uh, as we celebrate Gandhi, we celebrate his leadership of the Indian anti-colonial struggle, a struggle which in the end was a struggle against white supremacy and the oppressive colonial rule of the British Empire. For the African American people and all progressive and peace-loving people in the US, Gandhi sets an example and provides a vision in the fight for our common future. For far too long, the world has been ruled on the basis of European hegemony and persistent and enduring war. We turn to Gandhi and this year as a figure not of the past, but as a figure for our time, for this time. He teaches us how to stand for peace, justice, love and truth 
and how to believe in the oneness of humanity and the fight for unity in the midst of evil systems and ideologies that seek to keep us divided. That message is a message that we must embrace in this time. As I previously said, in celebrating Gandhi, we are also celebrating Martin Luther King Jr. But there were many fighters for black freedom before King who embraced the Indian anti-colonial struggle and Gandhi himself. Few people are aware that in the late 1890s, the Fisk Jubilee Singers from Fisk University, a black college in Nashville, Tennessee, traveled to India to sing what W.E.B. Du Bois called the Sorrow Songs, the rhythmic narrative of a disappointed people. And thus, by singing those songs, the Indian people touched the very souls of black folk. But then there was W.E.B. Du Bois himself, who called Gandhi a saint and said that Gandhi was continuing the work of Jesus Christ, the struggle for peace. Howard Thurman and uh, his wife, Sue Bailey Thurman, traveled to India in 1935 and met with Gandhi. Howard Thurman was one of the great theologians of the African American spiritual and religious traditions. Thurman, I should tell you, referred to Christianity as the religion of Jesus. Uh, he felt that Jesus was the prophet of the poor. And somehow Thurman believed that the word Christianity separated the religion from the actual work of Jesus himself. Then there was Mordecai Johnson, president of Howard University, who also traveled to India. Like Howard Thurman, he went there not just to find religion, but to find a link to the anti-colonial struggle and to link the struggle of the African-American people against racial discrimination and oppression to the struggles of the Indian people. And then there was Benjamin E. Mays, president of Morehouse College, where King got his undergraduate degree from, who also went to India, linking the struggles of the African-American people to this great struggle against British colonialism. In the process, a new intellectual and spiritual synthesis was created, a synthesis that further crystallized in the civil rights movement and under the leadership of Martin Luther King, but not only Martin Luther King, Coretta Scott King, James Lawson, and many others who embraced the concept of ahimsa, this Indian concept which is based upon the idea of not doing violence to any living thing, physical or psychological or spiritual violence, and Gandhi's concept of the force of truth, uh, Santa Gaudiya, the idea of uniting the spiritual with resistance to evil. The synthesis is still being worked out in the life world of the black church where 
this divide between the gospel of struggle and the gospel of prosperity and comfort still goes on among black church people. And it is in some ways present in the black community itself. Is the church an institution to make the comfortable more comfortable? Or, or should it be an institution which spearheads the fight for freedom, the ongoing struggle for freedom of black people? So it is this synthesis. And when you read King, you see this synthesis being worked out as he talked about Gandhi and his trip to India. And I would, you know, suggest to you that, you know, you go on Google and you uh, put in King and his uh, speech on Indian radio where he talks about his trip to the land of Gandhi. Uh, just to return to this concept of ahimsa, nonviolence as a principle of life and resistance in a world defined by violence. Why should the fighters for freedom and peace have a different moral standard than those they are fighting? Well, it is somewhat religious, but in being religious, it is also the highest expression of human ethical and moral values that all human life, all life period, has value. As Gandhi and King argue, there's a spark of the divine in all life. And because the divine exists in all life, all life should be respected. King gave a very famous sermon called Three Dimensions of a Complete Life. And that third dimension is what he called the upward reach of life. That moment of going beyond all that we know and think we know and all that we see and feel. That there's something greater, as he called it, a cosmic partnership. So the Hindu concept of ahimsa is not just Hindu, it's Buddhist, it's Muslim, it's Christian. It's to be found in the ancient, ethical, moral life of Africa and of all people. It is only modernity, the last 500 years, which begins with the transatlantic slave trade and plantation slavery that lays the foundation for capitalism and then for imperialism, where the concept of the individual detached from humanity becomes the moral standard, where war becomes noble and righteous, and peace in any of its form becomes the life of the coward, as it were. So in returning to this ancient concept, Gandhi returns to civilization before it was perverted by capitalism and war and white supremacy a return to a civilization that even if it did not realize the great ambitions of its philosophies and theology, at least had those values in 
its philosophy, the opposite of the civilization that we live in and the civilization that is 500 years old. Now, to King's question, where do we go from here? Chaos or community? Chaos or the beloved community? We are in a profound crisis. This crisis has been in the making for some time. There are many who want simple answers to a complex problem. If you listen to the news and cable news, all we have to do is elect Joe Biden in 2020 and everything will be okay. We'll get back on the right track. Well, that answer or that solution does not address the real problem, the problem of a system that no longer is able to meet even the minimum needs of the people. And interestingly, the people know it. This is a crisis produced by endless war. Six to seven trillion dollars spent since 2001 on wars in the Middle East. Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, and Libya. A system that makes it possible for trillion dollar corporations and billionaires to arise while most people who work live in or near poverty. We are told we're living in the best economy in decades. I don't think you would know it if you went down to downtown Philadelphia or San Francisco or Manhattan and you saw the homeless people. Obviously, those people who talk about this great economy are looking at the stock market and not at hungry children. Clearly, they're not looking at the complete ruin of what was considered at one time to be the great achievement of American capitalism, the so-called American middle class, which is being completely ruined and destroyed and driven into poverty and into the working class from which the majority of them had escaped a couple generations ago. The political system in our country, like that in many European countries, is fragmenting and falling apart. The well-known public intellectual and historian Arthur Schlesinger, Jr., argued that democracy in the United States was predicated upon a vital center that all political discourse and all political activity gravitates towards the center. You can come to the center from the right or you can come to the center from the liberal left. But the center is where we end up where we land and governance and even political discourse is predicated on compromise between the two sides meeting at the center. Well, the center has collapsed. Politics of the country are defined by the extremes 
and no compromise, what they call a zero-sum game. If I win, you must lose. It is this lack of a center, lack of a point for discourse that is leading to the fragmentation and the unraveling of the political system itself. More than that, the possibility of governance is becoming increasingly more difficult. If there cannot be compromise, I would suggest there can't be governance. In other words, the country is coming close to a situation of ungovernability where each side refers to the other as traitors and enemies of the people. In many ways, the chaos that we are seeing is not without precedent in American history. This looks something like and hauntingly like the period right before the American Civil War, where neither side could agree with its opponents. How do we move forward? I think Martin Luther King and Mahatma Gandhi have to be studied in new ways. I'm of the opinion that we in the United States and even in the black community have King all wrong. We just don't know him. And there's a reason for that. He's obviously not taught in the schools or colleges or in churches or civic organizations. We think we know him, but we do not know him. He was a revolutionary, as Martin Luther King said in 1966, we need a revolution of values in the United States. His courage was manifested in the fact that he not just went to India in 1959 and identified with the anti-colonial struggle and with Gandhi and Gandhiism, but he went to Ghana in 1957 to celebrate the independence of that West African nation from British rule. And he gave a famous speech entitled The Birth of a New Nation. He stood, as he would say, on the right side of history. And as he always reminded us, this struggle is not about any individual. It is about forces far larger than individuals or individual nations or even individual religions. King, in 1964, received the Nobel Peace Prize. When he returned to New York, he said, after giving all of the money of the Peace Prize to the civil rights organizations. He said, I must return to the valley because the valley calls. I must return to the people, to the poor, because they need me. You know, so interesting about King, he didn't seek celebrity. You know, he said, Vanity says I'll do it because it makes me look good. But he says, truth says I'll do it because it's the right thing to do. That's the example. And finally, King, as this great fighter for peace, 
broke with the American establishment and most in the civil rights and liberal movement. And in 1967, stood at Riverside Church in New York and gave the now famous speech for a time to break silence why I opposed the war in Vietnam. You know, a lot of people don't really understand the courage that it took to take that stance. Because all of the people who were praising him for the peaceful demonstrations and marches in the South suddenly turned against him. And he asked the question, why do you praise me when I speak out for nonviolence and peace in the South? But when I speak out for nonviolence and peace in Vietnam, you attack and condemn me. Literally, we call him a traitor. King in that speech said that he had no words for the National Liberation Front of South Vietnam or the government in North Vietnam, but he wished to speak to his own government. And these are his words, the major purveyor of violence in the world. Our country is still the major purveyor of violence in the world. And ironically, the nation that has exacted violence against poor people all over the world is now seeing the chickens come home to roost. Because we are the most violent society maybe in human history. And so we must return to King and Gandhi. We must return to their vision and extend it, a new synthesis, a synthesis that builds upon the synthesis that King originally and his colleagues originally developed in the 1960s. And we must bring into being a new synthesis in a more difficult and tragic moment in our national history. I don't know what I'm making myself all that clear. We have to rethink and reimagine what it means to be human, what it means to live in a society. What is religion? What is morality and ethics? What is our responsibility at this time? A new synthesis, a new fusion of the spiritual and religious traditions of humanity going back to the most ancient times and reasserting them in this time of trouble. At the forefront is the fight for peace. There can be no Green New Deal that is not connected to the fight for peace. We can't have clean air and clean water and new technologies and wind and, and solar power in this country while the US military occupies nations all around the world. We have over 800 bases throughout the globe. 
We cannot threaten nations like Venezuela and Cuba and North Korea and Iran and say, but we want a good life for our people. It just can't happen that way because humanity is now wrapped more securely in a single garment of destiny than ever before. And so if you want a Green New Deal in the United States, there must be a New Deal for peace for the peoples of the world. Not only that, but in fighting for the Green New Deal and fighting against war, in fact, I would suggest that we should put before our government that this country announces to the world that we will begin unilateral disarmament, beginning with nuclear weapons. We could do it. No nation threatens us, we threaten other nations. If this nation decided, the people decided that we are not going to study war no more, that would co constitute a revolution in human affairs, in human relations on a global scale. Take war out of the equation of American politics and American foreign policy, and humanity is liberated to think, to breathe, to be human. But in saying that, that we're not going to study war no more, we're also saying that we want justice. And not just justice for us. You know, I'm often, and I'm not going to talk too much longer, I'm often saddened at the discourses of what goes for black leadership today. They argue too often for the rights of black people but can sign off on military bills and warfare against people all over the world. That is not the black tradition, by the way. We owe humanity reparations for the harm that we have done to people all over the world. If there is hunger and poverty in India, in Vietnam, in Cuba or Venezuela, in Nigeria or South Africa or other countries around the world, our government and Western governments have a hand in it. The British robbed India blind and use the wealth that it got from India to build up its colonial occupation of Africa. For that reason, Nkrumah, Kwame Nkrumah, the father of Ghana, the Ghanaian nation, saw India's anti-colonial struggle and Gandhi as co-fighters for the independence of Africa. They believe that solidarity is, be is mutual aid between forces fighting for common objectives. Let me end on this. This year of Gandhi, as I've said, is the year of Martin Luther King. The year of Gandhi is the year of celebration of the Indian anti-colonial struggle and of the struggle for our civil rights, for our attempt to make this a humane nation, where all of the grand ideals of the anti-colonial struggle or the civil rights movement realized 
not by long shot. That is not to say the movements or the leaders were failures. It is to say that the task would take more than one movement or one generation. You know, I therefore take issue with those in these new movements of identity. There's nothing wrong with upholding your identity and discovering your identity. But when it becomes all about you, where your identity becomes so important that you forget about the poor, you forget about the working people, you forget about world peace, when that happens, it is a manifestation of a profound pessimism, if not cowardice, in the face of growing crises and oppression. I think uh, that going forward, and this is our beginning of the year of Gandhi, that we must study his work. Now I'm going to tell you something. As soon as you say Gandhi in the United States, you're going to get an army of intellectuals and academics that want you to know that Gandhi was hardly anything. Just like with Martin Luther King, he's been intellectually and politically assassinated. Those who once a year raise his name the most, are also the ones that do most damage to who he is and was. So it is with Gandhi. They don't like Gandhi. Although for most of these academics and intellectuals, if it were not for Gandhi, they wouldn't be where they are today. They'd probably be still in the village. And the same for the civil rights movement. King was not good enough or is not good enough for some people today. The question becomes, who are they? And what have they done? And what is their contribution? So we go forward, not because it will be popular, not because we will get any personal benefits from it. But we go forward in this year, first of all, because we can't do anything other than this. But we do it because it's right. Finally, like Martin Luther King said, in the end, I want to be on the right side of history. Tomorrow is today. The future is what we do today. Let us go forward courageously. Let us go forward with principle. Let us find ways to unite our people, all of our people, in a common cause, in a cause that people, ordinary people, can understand. Thank you very much.